Uh, and I, I think it's worth talking about. Young's modulus is something that um, I, uh, one of my favorite labs in um, my version of Physics 4A when I took it at Cerritos College many years ago. Uh, one of my favorite labs actually dealt with the Young's modulus. It uh, had this big setup with uh, really heavy masses being held by steel cable, I think. And um, so as you hang more mass, the steel cable extends a little bit. And using that, you can measure uh, Young's modulus of steel, whatever the cable is made out of. And as you make a careful measurement, you can also measure something called the hysteresis. And I, I really like that lab. It would be nice to have uh, something similar for uh, our class. Now, one thing is we, um, the way we cover our topics, uh, we skip this, um, and it's, which is totally standard. Uh, I used to be GSI at UC Berkeley, and they skip Young's modulus more or less too. And, um, and you know, it's not, uh, concept-wise, it's not difficult. And for those who, who might go on to be engineers, uh, especially civil engineers, it's a, a particularly uh, important topic, how materials deform under stress and force. So I just wanted to um, highlight some things and point out some things. You can read it through the section if you want. You know, that's true of any skipped topics. The textbook is there really to provide a comprehensive basis so that you don't have to rely on me covering everything that might be important there in the textbook. <laughs> so uh, I guess we can start out with some um, definition of uh, what they call stress. And uh, they should be defining strain. Um, stress in the simplest sense is uh, kind of simple. It's like pressure, uh, force per area. That's it. That's a stress. Um, we talked about force per area when we were discussing fluids, which your textbook will do <laughs> in the next chapter. Uh, stress and pressure have the uh, same unit, and they are similar in certain ways. Um, bulk stress is probably the closest to um, what you think of as pressure. I mean, you know, even this description, submarine in depth of ocean, yeah, that is exactly pressure. So so stress in many ways is similar to pressure. Now, with the tensile stress, you know, it's a little bit different in that you are pulling things apart rather than pressing, but uh, shear stress is a <laughs> little bit more different because it's uh, um, colliding kind of, uh, there's a kind of a saying that you might hear in a upper division mechanics, which is that um, stress is a tensor. <laughs> what is a tensor? And all, all that's meant to say is that stress is something that's um, mathematically more complicated object than a scalar, which is just a number, than a vector, which is just a, like a row vector, or sorry, column vector or row vector. Stress is a matrix. <laughs> so to fully characterize uh, any general kind of stress under any conditions, you don't need a whole matrix of stuff. Uh, but you know, your textbook talks about it in terms of tensile or bulk stress. A bulk stress would be the diagonal elements of the, <laughs> the matrix. And um, in order to include the shear stress in your mathematics, that's where you need the off diagonal elements. Anyways, um, but in the basic terms, we can think of stress as being like pressure. And strain, um, it, which is the second quantity that's necessary to describe Young's modulus, is the amount of deformation. I think uh, uh, it's defined as um, change in length per actual length, so like a fractional change in length. Um, <laughs> I swear I wasn't reading it. Fractional change in either length or volume. Um, so a strain is a unitless quantity. A stress has a unit of pressure, and strain by its design is a unitless quantity that tells you by what fraction it's changing. So, um, so this is uh, uh, something that comes from an observation that uh, as uh, things are being stressed, either being pulled, uh, pushed, or um, usually either being pulled or pushed. I think of being pulled is an easier one to consider because then you don't have to worry about materials moving out of way. So as you pull something, as you apply a tensile stress, 
stress. Um, if you observe any material, so you know, something like the strings, um, they, um, so to the very first degree, you might say, oh, as you pull, it doesn't uh, change its length. That's where we describe tension force and that sort of stuff. But so that's the um, roughest level description that's mostly correct. But as you observe it very carefully, if you tie down one end and you um, and you uh, kind of see as you apply more and more force, how much the other end changes, you might notice that it actually does move. So as you apply stress, there is strain. There is change in um, the length. And it's a very small amount for most materials. And for something weak like this string, um, if you pulled hard enough, eventually it would break. Now, before it breaks, where it's uh, stretching out a little bit, and when you release the stress, then it, it's not as stretched out. That's where we describe something called elastic modulus, or it, I learned it by the name Young's modulus. Um, and it's used to characterize materials. And the rest of the, so Young's modulus, uh, looking at this equation, it would be defined as stress per strain. So a material that has a very small Young's modulus, it, it indicates you know, stress over strain. Um, so strain would be large for relatively small stress. So uh, material with a small Young's modulus is materials that stretch easily. Like your spring is actually, you could describe a spring with a Young's modulus, except um, I guess uh, by convention, we use Young's modulus to describe material properties. And springs are made up of, you know, coil of thing and the how much it stretches. That's not a material property. That's the object property. So, um, but Young's modulus is the same idea, except at a material level. Um, so you apply some stress and then there's a restoring force that's like a Hooke's law force. It pulls it back and um, the amount of uh, stress that's needed to stretch it is proportional to the strain. So, um, now, so this can be used to characterize different materials. And it's a, you can see here, um, so materials that you think of as being strong, like a steel, you can see that has a, fairly large Young's modulus. And um, materials that are weak, like wood, or even hard wood, it has smaller Young's modulus. And it's on this table where you can describe um, different properties of like even metal. So, you know, it has several different metals, steel, nickel, iron, all kind of a similar Young's modulus. They are hard materials. And when you go to uh, aluminum, it has smaller Young's modulus. So when you're like building a structure or building an apparatus, then um, you do have to think about, you know, if you build it out of aluminum, um, in addition to all the other things, well, it's going to uh, deform more easily than iron would. It's just a part of the material property. So, yeah, and I guess that's maybe all that's there to cover. Um, and that's kind of the reason we skip and, you know, go through the rest of the textbook section, read the descriptions. And as I was preparing for this meeting, one thing kind of confused me because um, I had this uh, memory that um, bulk modulus out to be three times the uh, Young's modulus. And when you look at this table, that's not the case. So I'm misremembering something. Um, as you can see in this table, bulk modulus is pretty close to Young's modulus. So whether you are looking at the volume change as a fraction, um, as, you, uh, as a function of the bulk stress, or if you're looking at the change in the length with the tensile stress, uh, the, 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 for the same material, that kind of changes uh, not all that significantly different. Shear modulus is a different beast altogether, so I won't try to address it. This is sort of the thing that we do when we say, oh, stress is a tensor. <laughs> and what I mean is, oh, we don't want to really talk about it. Leave that up for an upper division graduate level classes <laughs> for your engineering classes. Um, 
So, so why did I think that bulk modulus should be, you know, there's some factor of three difference between the two. And I <laughs> looked around a little bit and finally figured out what I was confusing it with, which technically isn't part of this semester, but it's uh, something that a lot of you will see in the next semester. So might as well bring it up. It has to do with the thermal expansion. And, um, and I, I, there's a mathematical reason for what I'm about to show you. So let me just get to that. Thermal expansion. So with the thermal expansion, there's something called coefficient of expansion. Um, it's uh, kind of in some basic conceptual level similar to how we define Young's modulus. It's a phenomenological thing. So, you know, with the Young's modulus, you observe that as you apply force, there's a little bit of a deformation. So you do the experiment, measure it, and characterize it. Uh, a phenomenological description means something that's uh, experimentally based, uh, as opposed to like a theoretical explanation or anyways. Um, coefficient of thermal expansion is something similar. You get a material and you observe that when its temperature changes, its length changes a little bit. In fact, this phenomenon is basis of many of our thermometers. And this change can be characterized. Again, it's an experimental thing. So you can uh, measure the change of temperature, see how much uh, length has changed, and um, you get to an expression that looks like this. Uh, amount of change in length, turns out, yeah, it's proportional to length, kind of like with a strain. So there's something that looks like a strain here as well, and amount of strain, although I guess we don't call it that because it's outside of the context of Young's modulus. So amount of strain here is proportional to temperature. So when you come up with the, the coefficient of expansion, it'll be something per Kelvin per degree C. And this alpha is the coefficient of linear expansion, how much is something expands in one uh, dimension, one of the three dimensions. And um, this is the table for coefficient of linear expansion. And then you look through it. It's, you know, interesting to look through. You know, aluminum has that. There are some, uh, oh, iron also has a smaller coefficient of expansion. So I guess that's great. Um, and it, really in bar, I thought it could have been even smaller. And there are some materials with, uh, wait, there should be some materials with a negative coefficient of expansion. I'm not sure. Um, well, doesn't matter. <laughs> but okay, so as you look at this table, this is where you see something that um, I misremembered and somehow mixed up with the Young's modulus, which is the coefficient of volume expansion. It's defined the way that you'd expect it to be defined. Um, let's see, where do they, they talk about the actual definition of volume expansion? Yeah, the thermal expansion in two and three dimensions and coefficient of uh, volume expansion is this beta. Uh, so, um, and now, <laughs> so this is where I remember. Yeah, it's about uh, three times the linear coefficient. And you can see here, now it's not exact because, you know, material properties are complicated. It's, uh, so, you know, three times 25, well, that is, um, that is 75, ah, but three times 19, that's not 56, so that's, uh, uh, <laughs> that's, I think, a 58, no, 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 57, 57, that's 57, so it's one off. Uh, 17 times three, okay, that's 51. 14, okay, okay, the 12 times three, 36. Okay, that's off by one. Uh, I wonder which one has the greatest difference. Ah, this is one of those um, parts. 0 0.4 times three, it's 1.2, not one. And um, one of the things that affects quartz would be it's a crystalline structure. And when you have uh, some kind of crystal structure, then you can get uh, what's called anisotropy, uh, meaning uh, which direction look, you look, um, it makes things change. So when something has a crystal structure, it can could have a, a particular structure that uh, depends on what dimensions you look. I think maybe, I don't know. I'm not a material scientist. But so this is where you have that factor of three relationship. And uh, this comes from calculus. Um, in fact, let me see 
since your well not your textbook since this textbook refers to the the exercise 1.60 let's just go take a look um what that's all about so it says oh yeah show that um the bulk uh coefficient of volume expansion is equal to three times the coefficient of linear expansion by calculating an infinitesimal change in the volume of a cube. Okay, so uh, that's what I wanted to kind of demonstrate because it shows the uh, power of calculus, uh, kind of usefulness of calculus. So let me just quickly go through that. So this is what we have. Imagine that we have some object, a, a cube. Let's make it easy. Um, we have a, uh, uh, <laughs> do this right. Okay, we have a, a cube of length L on a side. And um, with the, the coefficient of the linear expansion, you can say, oh, so if I heat this thing up a little bit, the length of one side will change by a small amount, delta L. Or uh, let me use the calculus notation, small infinitesimal amount, DL. Um, so the kind of expanded cube would look like, okay, so this would expand to here. Now, um, in this dimension, it would expand a little bit as well. And finally, in the depth dimension, it will expand a little bit as well. So this uh, is the, uh, expanded the curve that you are dealing with. So what you have is, uh, so when you calculate the volume, the volume of a cube is L cube, and the, the <laughs> reason for the name, the new volume, the expanded volume, uh, would uh, each side of the cube would have the length L plus DL. So this is going to be L plus dl cubed. <laughs> that parenthesis closing is important. So um, you might look at it and think, that doesn't look like there would be any simple relationship. And this is the wonder of calculus. Uh, let me just uh, uh, do a simple thing here um, that doesn't really require calculus. Um, you could, it just, you know, you can just work out the algebra. You can take this expression and just uh, expand out the thing. Now, uh, I happen to have memorized something called the binomial coefficients. It comes from um, this, I think it's called the Pascal's triangle. Uh, you might have seen something that looks like this. It comes from, you know, uh, this is the sum of these, this is the sum of these, and... Uh, <laughs> I can keep going. <laughs> um, one of the really useful thing about uh, something like a Pascal's triangle is it gives you the coefficient for uh, when you have these two terms. Uh, it, there's a reason it's called the binomial coefficient, two terms, by, um, and you raise it to some power. Then uh, when it's a third power, so this is my zeroth row, first row, second row, third row, this third row gives me the coefficient of the terms that are going to come up. So when I do, the, do this, by the way, you can do this by hand, which might take even shorter than me explaining this particular procedure. Uh, when you do that, you end up with these terms. You have L cubed term. You have the um, uh, uh, L squared times the DL term. Um, you have L times the DL squared term. Uh, plus you have um, DL cubed term. Those are the terms. Oh, but I should have left the space in front of them empty because that's where these coefficients come in. The, that one there is the coefficient for this first term. That three there is the coefficient for this term. And I've gone in a certain order. I went in the order of decreasing power for one of the two terms and increasing power for one of the other terms. Um, so this term also has three, and this term also has, th uh, well, has one. So that's an expansion. Again, um, someone just uh, looking at it wouldn't think, hey, that, uh, I don't know, that doesn't look any simpler. It still looks very complicated to me. Now, this is the magic of calculus. This is the place part where 
describing this as infinitesimal is important. What that means is this is a quantity much, much, much less than L to the degree that it might be almost zero, but not quite zero. Again, that's the calculus limiting procedure. That, that's the conceptual work you have done in Math 3A that we lean on in our calculus-based physics. So the magic of calculus <laughs> is that when you have these very small changes, um, and you have these terms, you have um, that small change raised to power 1, raised to power 2, and raised to power 3. These two terms here that's been raised to higher power of this very small number, it's like taking 0 0.1 and squaring it and taking the thir third power and so on. Um, when you do that, you know, 0 0.1 squared is a 0 0.01, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So now we might call this an approximation um, without introducing calculus concepts. We could approximate this, real, this expression by saying, oh, these are dl squared, the dl cubed, they're going to be so small that we can ignore it. And, you know, approximation is fine. The uh, one challenge would be that, um, well, you know, it's an approximation, so it has some error associated with it. Um, the magic of calculus is one where this relationship is made precise in the limit where dl is much, much, much less than l. So in that limit where, or, you know, dl over l going to zero, approaching zero, that's the limiting procedure, this relationship becomes exact. We can say, oh, my uh, V prime, which I might describe as my original volume plus some change in volume is equal to, it's not approximately equal to, but it is exactly equal to um, this quantity here, L cubed plus um, this uh, second term here, which has only the first order non-vanishing term of dl prime plus 3l squared dl, uh, dl no, that's not prime, dl. <laughs> so this is the relationship you get, and that's where you get this uh, factor of 3. Let me uh, bring this home here. So this l cubed and v, they're the same quantity from here. So I can cancel those two out. So I have this, I have dv. So if you're just looking at, oh, so my I have uh, dv is equal to 3l squared dl. Um, that doesn't look, um, I don't know, it doesn't look different, uh, or it doesn't look simpler. Uh, I still have this l squared dl. Um, so, okay, uh, let me just play around with the expression a little bit. Um, if we are getting to a bulk uh, coefficient of volume expansion, then we are getting it, well, um, we need uh, some kind of unitless fraction, a volume change per volume. So on the left-hand side, I can do that. On the right-hand side, let me um, divide the, with the expression that's equal to volume, which is L cubed. So, um, so now you see some simplifications here. Um, so this cube. Uh, of the three, two of the factors will cancel with this. So now you have this. Uh, this is the fractional change in length. This is the fractional change in volume. And um, there was, you know, something that was relating this through the coefficient of linear expansion. And, um, and now you have this factor of three. The, that relationship again that I was confusingly uh, expecting in the Young's modulus that we don't have because um, so with the thermal expansion it's uh, I think a material science wise a lot simpler because you are just literally taking this and um, take changing um, molecular spacing between the uh, particles and but um, with the uh, with the Young's modulus situation where you have stress and strain then uh, I can see that this kind of simple mathematical consideration. 
might not necessarily apply. So I think I'm satisfied <laughs> with uh, just realizing that, oh, the factor of three that I was remembering that applies to thermal expansion, it's not going to apply here. Um, but uh, this kind of the binomial uh, coefficient, something that we call binomial um, expansion, binomial approximation, it's an uh, um, important analytical technique. We you, um, so I guess as long as I mention the word binomial approximation, I can kind of write out what that looks like. Um, I guess the, in the form I usually write, um, if you have one plus uh, some small number epsilon raised to power n, and right now for the time being, I'm going to pretend this n is an integer, doesn't have to be. Um, I don't think it even has to be a, a real number. Um, so <laughs> for an expression of this form, you can say it's approximately equal to one plus n times that small number. And that, that, that's what you see with this uh, uh, factor of three expression. This three is coming from this three through the calculus things we do.